Hi, I'm Annie Barker and welcome to my YouTube channel where I play covers, do tutorials, and talk about music criticism. I'm making a series of videos about a genre of music called dream pop. And in this video, I want to discuss its origins. If you like what you hear on this channel, please subscribe and hit the notification button. The word dream pop has made it into the Oxford English Dictionary, where it is said to denote a style of popular music, usually featuring layered guitar effects and quiet or breathy vocals, in which the creation of an atmospheric, textured, and often ethereal sound is as important as the melody, lyrics, etc. Wikipedia defines dream pop like this. It is a subgenre of alternative rock and neo-psychedelia that developed in the 1980s. The style is typified by a preoccupation with sonic texture and atmosphere as much as melody. It often overlaps with the related genre of shoegaze, and the two genre terms have at times been used interchangeably. Dream pop is thought to relate to the immersion in the music experienced by the listener. The All Music Guide adds this to the definition. Dream pop often features breathy vocals and processed echo-laden guitars and synthesizers. Though the Cocteau Twins with their indecipherable vocals and languid soundscapes are frequently seen as the leaders of dream pop, the genre has more stylistic diversity than their slow electronic textures. Dream pop also encompasses the post-velvet underground guitar rock of Galaxy 500, as well as the loud, shimmering feedback of My Bloody Valentine. It is all tied together by a reliance on sonic texture, both in terms of instruments and vocals. In the book How Soon Is Now, published in 2012, Richard King credits the coinage of the term dream pop to Alex Ayuli of the band A.R. Kane, uh, who used the phrase to describe his own band. Music critic Simon Reynolds used the label dream pop to then describe the same band. He later extended the term to the nation's shoegazing scene in the UK. In fact, in the 1990s, the words dream pop and shoegazing were interchangeable. However, I disagree with some of the features listed in these definitions. If the music of the Cocteau Twins is understood today to be dream pop, and we consider the vocal style of their singer, Elizabeth Fraser, then dream pop vocals are not, as the Oxford English Dictionary and the All Music Guide hold quiet or breathy, nor are they always indecipherable. The use of the term languid to define the Cocteau Twins in the All Music Guide is particularly incorrect. Languid means listless, uh, fatigued, slow-moving, spiritless, and insipid. The soundscapes of this genre, which many of us love, are anything but listless and spiritless. When one close reads these definitions of dream pop, the hostility many people hold towards it becomes salient. Both the OED and Wikipedia compare dream pop to shoegaze, and the All Music Guide even encompasses the significantly different sounds of My Bloody Valentine, Gal Galaxy 500, and the Cocteau Twins in the same genre. And while I can listen to and appreciate the music of each of these bands for different reasons, I certainly would not shove them into the same genre. To answer the question, what is dream pop? I asked two members of the Cocteau Twins, Simon Raymond and Robin Guthrie. Simon Raymond says, I have no idea what it is. I would be embarrassed to use the term myself. It's so limiting and pejorative. If that's the best I can do when being asked to describe music, then I'm in the wrong job. To explain his refusal of the term dream pop, he says, I joined Cocteau Twins after their second LP, and already the band had been described as goth, post-punk, alternative, indie, and cult. Within a year or two of me joining, new wave, new age, new age psychedelia, ethereal pop, and no doubt several more limp descriptive efforts to try to put the music into another little box. As each album was released, we seemed to have found another box to be placed conveniently inside. 
And Robin Guthrie says, genre crushes individuality for musicians, and I would not want to be categorized as making the same music as others. Robin recognizes that the Cocteau Twins influenced bands that came after them. He holds that dream pop came after the Cocteau Twins. Even still, he's hesitant to allow for the term dream pop to be used to describe a musical genre. Both Simon and Robin categorically deny that the Cocteau Twins were a dream pop band. I want to take you on a journey to a moment in music history, a moment when certain creative energies came together to found a new sound a new way of making songs that disrupted the musical territory and rebelled against the expectations of the music industry. In 1980, two young Scottish musicians, Will Hagee and Robin Guthrie, who had been playing together in various stooges like rock and cover bands in Grangemouth, decided they wanted to play something more cool based on their indie influences. So they formed a band and they called it the Cocteau Twins. Armed with a new drum machine, a Dr. Rhythm DR55 acquired in Glasgow, Robin and Will headed into a rehearsal studio to write some songs. Robin was dating a young woman, also from Grangemouth, Liz Fraser. He asked her to come to the rehearsal room and try singing with the band. The material they wrote together later became the songs of the group's first album, Garlands. These songs were not what one would define as dream pop. Simon Raymond recalled to me that when he worked at Beggar's Banquet Records in 1981 and 82, before he had joined the Cocteau Twins, he described the band to customers as a Scottish post-punk band with a difference using drum machines and with unique female vocals. However, if one attempts to determine the generic features of the early Cocteau Twins, one would be misled by the album Garlands recorded in December 1981. In interviews, Robin has said that he wanted to produce songs with strongly affected drum sounds, as he had on his demo tapes, but the engineers and the producers in the studio for the Garland sessions told him, oh no, you can't do that, that's going into the red. 19-year-old Robin, having just been signed to the 4AD label by Ivo Watts Russell, felt particularly grateful to the label for signing them. He also did not have the production experience of the engineers in the studio, and he even felt a little intimidated by the adults in the room and ultimately deferred to their taste. To this day, Robin holds that the drums on Garland's were not the sound he'd wanted. Yet, this is the album we hear today. For the tour for Garland's, Robin programmed and recorded the drum machine through the effects he initially wanted, with lots of reverb and fuzz boxes, creating a wider and more rumbly swimming sound. This is what he took to play on stage. So these songs, the first ones by the Cocteau Twins, have two different manifestations. One version is the album, with clean, sharp drum sounds produced by a Roland TR-808 drum machine borrowed from Depeche Mode, who was in the studio next door. And the other version was played on stage by the band who had a different vision for their sound. For the next two EPs, Lullabies and Peppermint Pig, Robin was still not allowed to satisfactorily get the sound he wanted. However, after extensive touring and a little bit of fame following the release of Garland's, Robin gained more confidence as a musician. He spent more time sitting at the mixing desk, mentored by an engineer named John Turner. On the Cocteau's second album, Head Over Heels, a number of factors came about that allowed Robin to get the sound he wanted on the songs. And this moment is significant in music history. Here you can pause this video and listen to the song Garlands on the Cocteau Twins 1982 album of the same title. To avoid running into problems with copyright laws, I won't play the tracks I'm talking about in the video. Instead, I link to them here. Listen to the first minute and a half and then meet me back here on the video. What sticks out to me most when I listen to Garland's are the sharp hits of the kick, snare, and hi-hat played by the drum machine. They drive the song as did many other similar beats in pop music of the early 80s. 
The drum hits pierce through the wide backdrop of Robin's distorted guitar sound, which opens the track, and stand perpendicular to the rhythm guitar. When Liz's vocals come in, they are forced to compete with the drums and bass for sonic attention. As one who enjoys Liz's vocals, I feel that the drums and bass distract me from her voice. When the bass comes in, the song solidifies into a testosterone-driven post-punk track, bass and drums leading the way. At the minute mark, Robin's guitar comes back in, but sounds as if it's in the wrong band, because actually it is. It's not the sound the Cocteau Twins wanted to make. Now, you can pause this video and listen to the song When Mama Was Moth on the Cocteau Twins 1983 album Head Over Heels. At this point, the Cocteau Twins consisted of only Robin and Liz, Will Heggie had left the band, and Simon Raymond had not yet joined. Head Over Heels was engineered and produced by Robin Guthrie. Click the link here, listen to all three minutes of this song, and then meet me back here on the video. The first thing you'll notice is the massive reverb Robin placed on the opening drums, even on the kick. This would have been considered a cardinal sin by many sound engineers at the time. Now notice how that reverb creates a massive stereo width of field. The fuzzy drum sound does not serve as um, pillars or foundations for the song as the drums on Garland's do. Instead, it suspends the song on a sonic width achieved by its reverb. When Mama Was Moth does not have bass lines, um, as if the Cocteau Twins are announcing their current lineup for this album. Upon this are then layered the guitar sounds also wide in effects and doubled. This sonic landscape, different in form from what had come before, is the scene into which Liz's vocals will enter. Her singing, also doubled and affected in the mix, winds a path through this scene set by Robin. There's no competition from sharp drum hits, nothing sticks out against the other elements. The listener feels immersed in the scene swept along by the beauty of the sonic layers. An interesting story from 1984 is indicative of the great import of Robin's production choices on Head Over Heels. For the next album, which would become Treasure, the record label wanted to bring in somebody big to produce it. So Iva Watts Russell introduced the Cocteau Twins to Brian Eno. Eno brought along a certain Danny, Daniel Lenoir, to the meeting. During their meeting, Robin asked Eno what he would have done differently on Head Over Heels, to which Eno replied, nothing. Richard King reports in How Soon Is Now that Eno told Robin that he didn't think he'd be as brave as Robin was on Head Over Heels to use that size of reverb. It was decided then that Robin would continue in his role and produce Treasure himself. Now go and listen to a minute and a half of 5, 10, 50 fold, the second song on Head Over Heels, and then meet me back here. Robin's jangly guitar fills the space widely. While driving the song along, it sparkles on all sides. The snare and kick, again brimming with reverb, gives the song a laid back sway feeling, while the hi-hat rings out a waltz. The chorus affected bass, swaying with the reverb drums, shifts the bass to a more melodic function, tethering the moving parts and the floating parts together. Onto this, Liz's vocals are layered, doubled, even tripled, emerging from all sides of the sonic space, sometimes wailing, sometimes twirling. Her vocals in the chorus are so affected that it sounds as if there's an entire choir of Liz. Now let's listen to Sugar Hiccup, which Cam Lindsay of Exclaim Magazine writes could single-handedly be the conception of Dream Pop. Click on the link to the song here, listen to the first minute and a half of the song, and then meet me back here. Sugar Hiccup is the most pop of the song so far. The vocals are phrased in melodic hooks, and the drum and guitar layers follow a straightforward pop structure. 
Robin's pulsing double tap bass lines propel the song and serve the harmonic structure as much as the rhythm of the track. There's an innocence in Robin's guitar arpeggios countered by the epic sound of the Mellotron. And yet, this is all delivered in the new form, a layered color palette, a novel use of the usual gear, pushing the technology to bend the sounds into new shapes. Consider these features of the Cocteau Twins music on Head Over Heels, a new use of the technology, pushing it past the usual limits, a disengagement of drums from anchoring, a suspended foundation, big reverb on the drums, multiple layers of guitars, wide jangly sparkling guitar sounds, multiple layers of affected vocals, manifold beauty in the vocals, and all of these layers blended well with no elements sticking out. And of course, reverb the size of courage. These are some of the defining features of a genre that will later be called dream pop. I hold that this album, Head Over Heels, in which Cocteau Twins with Robin Guthrie in control of production and engineering, and in which Robin and Liz expressed a brave new aesthetic in music, is the beginning of dream pop. But there's one more part to this story that I want to tell you. One of the distinguishing features of dream pop is that it is beautiful. But if the Cocteau Twins began as a post-punk group, and among their influences were the birthday party and the pop group, from where did the beauty arise? When I asked Robin what inspired him to make the song so expansive and beautiful, he told me, when I listen to songs, I hear everything that is wrong, like in a mix, for example. The guitars in the pop group or the birthday party, they had guitars that stuck out, and I didn't want that. I wanted to make everything fit in with the other elements. I wanted the guitars to mix well with this singer, he's referring to Liz, that had a really unique way of singing and unique sounding voice, and I didn't want anything to be out of place. The Cocteau Twins was mainly Liz and I, and the music we were making was our comfy place to be. You want to make your space comfy and a nice place to be, and that's what I wanted to do with the sound. And then he told me, there's an intimacy when you have the headphones and the talkback mic into the vocal booth where your girlfriend is. There's an intimacy in working that way, and you're in close dialogue and working it all out tighter. So there was Robin making a beautiful sonic nest, layers of drums, bass, and guitars floating in effects for Liz's exquisite singing. Liz in the vocal booth, her voice close on the mic, and hearing Robin through the headphones, these two musicians creating these songs in intimate and close dialogue, establishing their own sound. If I may be so bold, I call this love. And I hold that the origin of the beauty in their music is Robin's and Liz's love for each other. There, in the studio, in love, and driven by the vision of this sound of their own, Liz Fraser and Robin Guthrie birthed a new aesthetic in music, one that set out the foundations for a new genre, retrospectively called dream pop. Thank you.